Well, welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. Welcome very much to our session, Teach the Class with Your Own Example. We have our speaker here from Hudson Valley Community College, um, Linda Ryder, and I'm Monica Hill, Senior Client Experience Manager with Blackboard. And I will hand it over to Linda to introduce herself and get started in her session. If you have questions, please um, drop them in the chat and I will keep track and um, Linda will answer them at the end. Thank you, Linda. Thanks, Monica. Um, I'm going to be using Blackboard instead of a PowerPoint. I'm just going to be navigating around this course environment, which is pretty much the way I use it in my classroom. So I thought it would be a little bit more authentic. Um, so what I'd like to do um, is show you around my spring modern art history class with some of the um, items that I've added uh, about, uh, you know, the, the strategy that I have that I want to share with you guys. And I'm hoping that this is going to show everybody just how easy it is to move seamlessly between, say, this Blackboard online and in class with students so that it's sort of a seamless experience for them. Um, and I'm also hoping that what I can show you is how to get students coming to class more prepared and then more engaged once they get there and really invested in their own learning. So I'm trying to do this quickly so we could spend some time chatting and asking questions. So um, quickly, I'd like to just, I'm going to inter, uh, introduce um, myself and my experience with Blackboard over the years and uh, who my students are. And then also some early examples of the pre-class posting that I have um, expanded upon in uh, the current, uh, my current teaching. Uh, then spend maybe 10 minutes showing you what it is that I'm actually doing now and some of those successes and, and some of the interesting things that emerged from that, um, including the strategy and importance of iterative quizzes and time on task in uh, preparing this strategy of teach the class about a quick conclusion about uh, how students, how we can help students understand the time and place of learning through um, a seamless online and classroom strategy, and then hopefully some time for questions, because I'm really interested to see how uh, some of you are, are probably doing a lot of these same things, maybe in different combinations. So um, quickly, I'm just going to, And again, this is similar to how I'd be working in class. Blackboard's always up. Blackboard's part of everything that we do in my classroom. It just sort of norms the whole environment. So I've been using Blackboard since uh, Course Info, 1998. I was working for a not-for-profit, not and um, it was a statewide arts and ed faculty development project. The uh, website we were using was a homegrown website with um, a linked threaded discussion and i mean i'd get a lot of 10 o'clock tech calls asking about what to do because they were like on dos machines I mean, it was just crazy early uh technology and then we lost our funding for the web person and i went um around and I searched around and i said oh look at this cool thing called blackboard right so I taught myself how to use it that weekend, and then next thing you know, I'm explaining uh, at our annual conference at the Kennedy Center, hey, you know, you could use this for professional development. You could do professional development across the entire state with this online learning management system, or course management system, I think is what they were calling it at the time. So then, <clears throat> excuse me, in 2000, um, I became the academic technology coordinator at Colby Sawyer College in New Hampshire, and I brought Blackboard in as a primary tool, and I became the system administrator. I trained the faculty. <clears throat> and then um, I was on the board of trustees for Northeast Regional Computing, and we negotiated a consortium license for the NERCOMP colleges in New England and Canada. So in 2004, um, I contracted with New England College and to manage their Blackboard system and train their graduate faculty, support their users. Then I came back to the Capital District and started at Hudson Valley Community College later in 2004. I was still managing the New England College system remotely. Um, and then here I am, 2021. I'm the senior instructional designer at Hudson Valley Community College. I trained faculty on technical aspects of Blackboard and best practices in online teaching and learning. And then I work with very closely with ITS to support the system itself. We do a lot of 
you know, pretty intense diagnostics, not what usually instructional designers do, but that's just how it shook out here at some point. Um, we support various integrations and, you know, troubleshoot things with publishers. Um, I also teach two to four classes a semester for the fine arts, theater arts, and digital media department. So I am totally immersed in Blackboard um, almost every day, so, and all day long. Um, so who are my students? Well, my students, because I've always worked in what were essentially open enrollment institutions. So they present with diverse levels of academic preparedness for college level work. They, um, many of them have not yet developed any self-regulated learning strategies. The content that I deliver, I teach art history, um, fashion history, um, and you'll see some of the earlier examples I'm showing you. I was teaching digital literacy, uh, computer concepts, computer uh, programs. So some of those needed to be, you really had to deliver it in a variety of formats and uh, in order to get across to everybody. And then also teach them how to learn while you were teaching them the disciplines. And that just meant that differentiation of instruction was just mandatory. I mean, you just didn't even think about teaching it without that. So that's where Blackboard was um, particularly um, useful for what we were trying to accomplish. So I want to give you some older examples. This is kind of fun for some of you that haven't seen some older versions of Blackboard or just, you know, their distance memories. I've got some examples here from 2003 and 2006 um, that I think you'll enjoy. So the whole concept of this uh, session is using this idea of teaching the class. So the students teaching the class uh, helping them learn and helping them be more prepared and being more invested in the content that you're working with um, at any given time. So we first discovered uh, a little bit of success with this in 2003. I was at a four-year residential college, Colby Sawyer, and you know the students were using these big boxes of computer stuff on the in their dorm rooms and in the computer labs and they were connecting to the world wide web which they thought had been around forever and computers which they thought had been around forever but actually um at that point uh we didn't have a lot of anything like you know cloud storage or there wasn't even a lot of shared drives i mean everybody was sharing things on floppies um, they they were really struggling with what is this difference between hardware and software. There was like this box, there was these things in it. What did it do? How did it talk? So, you know, we had a, a digital um, literacy course that the first whole first couple of weeks was about uh, computer concepts and what a computer is, what it does. Just It just wasn't working. They were still very, very confused. So we Hi, brought... Martha. Sorry yeah, to interrupt. Yeah. Could you just um, zoom in a little bit? Just ah, okay. Little yes. Little Thank you. Thank you. So make this a little bit bigger. Let's okay. see. I think we were before we were at 135. Did that help? Yeah, I think that's better. Thank you. Gr okay, great. And let's see, we'll bring this up a little bit so people can, here we go. Uh, let's see. So um, what we did was bring in ITS people and say, hey, you know, get our students excited about hardware and software. See if you can, you know, help them um, figure this relationship out. That was pretty boring for them. They didn't really respond to that. We had some videos, they didn't respond to that. And then we discovered that uh, Wheaton College, another little college, had um, a class where they would take the whole computer apart and put it back together again. And we didn't have the capacity to do that. But what we could do is bring someone in to take a computer apart in front of the class. Once again, that was still passive. They're still watching. It's still sort of abstract. So long story short, we assigned them each a piece of computer hardware. And then they had to research it and post about it in the discussion uh, forum. And then um, during the class, when our ITS person was taking apart the computer and handing the pieces out, that student uh, who had that particular piece 
would explain to the class what it was, how it connected to the rest of the computer, why it was important, the different uh, variations on it that you might find. Um, and the nice part was it was in their words. They were communicating with each other as peers, and they were genuinely excited about it. Uh, to give you an example, let me just pull up this very old PDF here. Allie doesn't like it, as you can see, because it is very old. It's almost 20 years old. So this was the discussion board in, um, I don't even know, I think this wasn't course info, but it was only a few years later. Uh, a couple of the interesting ones, let's see if I can get us to this. Why is this not? Okay, now that I've expanded, hang on one second, I'm going to make this a little bit smaller. I'm trying to, here we go, get this. I just wanted to show you an interesting, a couple of interesting examples of. So, for instance, choosing a monitor. I didn't know that there would be so many different options to choose from. A monitor is how we see what we're doing on our computer when we're typing a paper or even playing in paint. Then the student goes on to explain the different kinds of monitors. Um, and the CD. Uh, ROM person was interesting because uh, what one of the things that they were talking about was whether or not you could watch, let's see if I can find this one, here it is. Um, what they would talk about, well, you know, if you get a CD-ROM drive, you can play CDs. But if you get a CD player, you're not going to be able to watch, do the CD-ROMs or the DVDs. That's what it was. You couldn't do the DVDs. If you had a CD-ROM, you could watch that in your DVD player. But if you had a DVD, you couldn't play it. And so they were recommending that everybody in the class make sure that they get a DVD drive in their uh, computer. So in another example of them using their own words, you know, a graphics card, a circuit board with its own memory, and uh, so it handles the intense stuff a computer has to go through in order to display graphics. I would never explain it that way to my students, but students explaining that way to each other was really useful to them. So that's the sort of thing that we thought was, you know, uh, really successful, and we wanted to to replicate some of that. So we then were looking at some other examples of where they would be able to share things. Um, I think you guys need this to be a little bit bigger. Um, this was one of the jigsaw assignment, jigsaw puzzle assignments we did where all the students do one part and then they put it together to make a larger piece. They were making web sites, uh, learning to make websites. And they all had to research a topic and do an annotated bibliography. And actually, the best way for them to share, whether they were in their dorms or in the classroom or in the library, was to actually share it through Blackboard. They just all loaded it up as an attachment to the discussion board. They did some peer review. Then they borrowed each other's resources. And the, ho the whole caliber of these websites uh, was exponentially improved. And I can try to show you this one as well on the enlarged screen. There it is. So really, it was very simple. This is another view of the discussion board from 2003, Blackboard. Um, it was just simply added as an attachment, and they would all just jump in and share each other's material. And it was a great way to collaborate. The um, third one that was really informative for us in, in the older um, activities that we were doing was building a test together. So this was not my computer class. This was my one of my um, art history classes here at Hudson Valley. And what the challenge was is that students frequently cram for a test. And if you, if you do a, a review session, they don't show up. Uh, they don't actually know how to study, but they don't really want to show up for the review class. And I teach Monday nights from 6 to 9, which is not a very popular time. So um, there's always a, a better thing to do on a Monday night than come to a review class. So what we did was um, I, I took some ideas from some of my previous uh, classes, and I said, let's, let's have them you know, build this uh, exam themselves. So not the whole thing, but you know, a good 25% of it. And so what we had them do was load these up. And let's look 
there we go. And basically they put the question in the subject line and the answers in the text. And we just brought it up in uh, collect view in the class. Then everybody took the test on a piece of paper in the classroom. And then uh, the person who had posted the question led a discussion about why they thought it was an important question, why they thought the answer that they had um, chosen as the correct answer was correct, why the other ones were wrong. And then we also could, as a class, because I usually teach in a computer lab, look up additional information about the topic if there was something that we didn't understand. Um, I was really pleased to see that uh, some of these were not just factual, like who did this painting, but, um, you know, uh, Gino Severini's armored train is a primary example of what futurist idea. Uh, these are these are pretty advanced um, concepts for community college students. So I, I was impressed with the, the level of the questions that were uh, created and they became 25% of the test. So what happened is that students that skipped the review didn't know what 25% of the test was going to be. The ones who were there didn't know what 25% would be and more because we had discussed all the concepts around it. And they were very invested and they actually were part of that process of uh, deciding what was important in the class, what needed to be assessed and how it was going to be assessed. So those were just like sort of fledgling um, forays into uh, having them uh, teach each other and using some of those strategies. So what I'm doing now is really the, the topic of this session. Just, excuse me as I look at my notes. So we're using um, some very robust templates that uh, distance, our distance learning unit puts together for faculty. Our templates are uh, can be edited. They're really just a framework. They're not, you know, you know, set in stone. But uh, the nice part about it is we do present with a deconstructed syllabus. So uh, faculty can just fill this out and students will pretty much see this structure in whether it's a web enhanced course or a fully online course. I'm doing this as if it is a fully online course. I'm just going to get this down a little bit here. So I can navigate. Um, we also create a full table. Um, so the entire schedule for the entire course is there for students, just as it would be in an online course. But it's just as important, if not more so, in a face-to-face -face class, particularly if you only meet once a week. So they have this idea that they're learning in the class in these columns over here, prepare to discuss, defend, and debate. Um, we'll have some media because no one wants to listen to me talk for three hours. And um, a little lecture that I'll do that's usually interactive. It's more of a discussion, but it's kind of wraps up ideas. And this is the, the class time. This homework is done in preparation for this class time. It's visually there. And after they get into that rhythm, it's something that they just naturally do. They're not wondering, geez, what are we doing? What do I, what should I have done? They know exactly what needs to be done. They're going to be doing their reading, looking at some online materials, and they're going to be, um, let me just get back here one second. Here we go. So that uh, table corresponds to this module structure, which you know a lot of people don't do that in a face-to-face -face class. They'll do it in an online class. Um, but doing it for a face-to-face -face class is just as important because it gives students that opportunity to plan and, and just know what's coming uh, down the road in their class. So they know that every week there's going to be assigned reading and there's going to be a study guide to help them with that. There'll be a quiz, which we're going to look at in a minute, because those are um, iterative and they're very graphic intensive. Um, there'll be online resources to help them teach the class with their own examples, sometimes just as a um, good image source website will be added, or some key documents or some videos. 
a link to the forums for posting their Teach the Class essay, an agenda for what we're going to do in class, and materials to be used in class, some of which I might not reveal until we're actually in class, depending on what the activity is. So what that might look like, for instance, in this one would be just like an online class, but it's face-to-face, -face, and this comes up in class. Before we leave, this comes up for the next week. And it's um, also what we'll look at as soon as we come to class. So the study guide, the quiz, um, online material. So in this case, they're working with early modern manifestos. So the manifestos are here, so they don't have to go look them up. It's sort of a kind of a curated resource list, a little bit like a web quest. Also a video that they'll be comparing abstract art to um, the visual symbols in uh, religious traditions color theory, et cetera. So all of that material is there for them, as well as a link to teach the class about that topic with their own examples, the agenda for class, and then the lecture material, which you know we can look at uh, in a minute. So let me go back to So here is an example. Um, this is sort of like the, the main concept of today's session. Um, and that's the post they do before they come to class that I then look at before class and I annotate them. We bring them up in class. And in this case, they're being asked to compare Impressionism to Post-Impressionism with their own examples and teach these concepts to the class and also explain how, um, uh, how they, you know, what the, the historical context is and the different artists and um, how they're all a little bit different. So the yellow is really important um, key points that I think they've made that everybody should, you know, learn and, and know about and can ask the uh, student about. Purple are ones where I'm asking them to clarify a little bit. And then we're, again, we're in a computer lab. Nobody kind of gets that idea. It's like, oh, let's pull up the ebook. Let's pull up, uh, you know, the website. Let's take a look. So it's a very dynamic conversation that's led by the student who wrote the post. And as you can see, they're, they're doing a very good job. They're bringing up really good examples. If you see a lot of yellow, everybody's looking for a lot of yellow in their post. It means they did a good job. Purple means they have to talk a lot because they have to clarify what they really mean. So one of the reasons that I, I like to do this is because the teaching presence that um, you're, you're giving the student an opportunity for teaching presence. They're, they're, they're feeling more responsible for really knowing the material. They, they need to know it a little more deeply than they would if they were just spitting it back on a multiple choice test. But it could be really daunting to write at this level if you weren't prepared. And to be that prepared for this class, you really need more time on task. That's not something that they're all particularly good at. And so one of the most important things that makes this possible are the quizzing um, activities that they do, which let me just bring you back. So these quizzes encouraged uh, time on task and um, iterative investigation because they have unlimited attempts. You can take it as many times as they want until they get the grade they want. And, but it cuts off at the start of class. It has to be done before class, as does their posting. So um, they're very image rich because one of the things that will happen when you're teaching art history, and also I teach fashion history as well, so it happens there. Lots of pictures, lots of pictures with the readings. And the uh, book will say something and reference a picture, and they will not go and look at the picture. And sometimes what the book is saying is a little confusing if you don't actually look at the picture and say, what are they talking about? So um, there's a slight gamification quality in my quizzes that because they can level up taking it more and more and because 
they're hard. They really do have to go back and look at the book. They really have to look at what is this book talking about. Um, and then it makes the teach the class writing less daunting. So let's take a quick look at one of these and give you an example. Um, I have a strategy, three out of five. You know, it's a lot easier to make a three out of five question than a one out of four. You can write three things that you know about something and two very plausible distractors a lot more easily. And it will also help the students learn context, concept, and facts all in the same question because they're going to learn from these as much as they are going to assess themselves. So, and frequently I will not say who you know, who did this? Who did this painting? Instead, I'm asking them why it's important, what are the aspects of it, and these are all things that are referenced in, art, in the art historical um, language in the book. So they're learning to use that vocabulary. And then you'll also see in a textbook something like, um, you know, uh, the ambiguity of figure and ground facilitated by an opening up of contours. Well, what does that mean? If you don't look at the picture and actually figure out what that means, you know. So you could actually, based on, re if you read the text closely, you could click exactly on the spot in this painting where they're referencing the ambiguity of figure and ground facilitated by an opening up of contours. But what does that mean if you're not looking at a picture? So that's why I make these things graphic um, and uh, concept rich. Same thing illusionism in the middle of a you know renaissance illusionism in the middle of a cubist painting training their eye to see these things in the work or the subtle differences between all the different kinds of cubism there is more than one kind of cubism or where is the natural form found in the real object in reverse picasso's guitar not who did this guitar with you know or what is the name of this painting or when was it made but understanding those concepts taking these things over and over frequently randomly generated from larger pools um, this has been really helpful in getting students to know the material i know it works in the online environment students actually in the evaluations repeatedly tell me this was my favorite part of the course taking these quizzes over and over again it really helped me understand the reading it really helped me focus on what i needed to know Okay, let's get out of this test. And I'm almost done here. So when we're in class, we would do um, some uh, video again, so they don't have to listen to me for three hours. Uh, there may be a deep link to some library materials so that we can do a little deeper dive on a key concept like art and politics. Um, and also, I'm constantly demonstrating to them how to find really good resources in the library. So lots of deep linking and lots of research activities. Another reason to be in a computer lab when I teach anything. There's always the images from the textbook in the publisher's PowerPoint. And then I will usually present a lecture, but my lectures are built on the other concepts that we talked about. Um, in this case, the discussion for this one was about the manifestos. Um, and so we basically discussed, based on different artists, the key concepts. A couple of questions, a main work of art make those connections, compare and contrast, use uh, art historical vocabulary, wrap your head around complicated things, push, push, push the ideas. We're not a class that sits and memorizes. So that it would that's what would happen in class, um, at which point I would then, you know, uh, wrap up the class and, and bring up the calendar for the next week and bring up the module for the next week. And I think the um, last point I'd like to make is this idea of helping students understand the time and place of learning. I, back in 2010, I did a little design experiment with a couple of sections of modern art history. So one was on campus, one was online. They had exactly the same resources in the LMS. 
I was teaching the uh, on-campus class in a computer lab. I was not bringing those discussion posts into the classroom as I am now. I had them doing them, but they were not coming into class. I was a little dismayed to see that between the two, the one where I was physically present helping them was the class that did not do as well. I thought, oh no, <laughs> maybe it's me. Um, actually, what um, some of the survey instruments and some of the interviews that we did revealed that for them, the class, the students that were on campus, they were they were considering the place, uh, time and place of learning to be in the classroom. I mean, that was it. You know, that Blackboard environment was something extra. It was out there. It was external. It was like a, you know, uh, sometimes the publisher uh, homework environments too, where they are sometimes a little isolating. The um, students that were online knew that everything in there was uh, there to help them. And they would say that in the uh, in the evaluations, they would say, oh, this was so helpful. I was so glad I had this. I really enjoyed, you know, th they just, they saw everything that they did and they were constantly in the LMS and they just saw it all as them learning in that environment. The on-campus students just didn't connect that LMS with the learning experience because they were on campus and that's where they were going to learn, it was in my classroom. So bringing some of these things in it's really subtle it's a little bit like flipping it's a little bit like web enhancing but the the subtle difference i think is that having you know this environment be seamlessly available in class that we're on computers in the class we've got this environment brought up in the front of the room everything that they do for homework is ultimately going to make its way into the classroom through blackboard i'm in blackboard they're in Blackboard, we're all in Blackboard, um, and it's one, and the classroom and Blackboard are, you know, a, a seamless learning environment. And it's, again, subtle, but it seemed to make a real difference. And I, and what I don't have an answer for is what's going to happen now after all of this COVID remote teaching and this um, kind of norming of not being physically present in a classroom to learn. They all had a, a big taste of that. And there, I know there is some confusion for some of them, even around asynchronous classes. It's like, where's the Zoom? <laughs> There's no Zoom, it's asynchronous. Um, so it's, it's gonna be really interesting to see if that time and place of learning uh, concept changes. So hopefully we have, do we have time for some questions, at least a couple minutes? Yes, thank you, Linda, that was so wonderful. And I think the, the biggest questions we have or um, to what extent you can share <laughs> this course. Um, someone asked if um, you could share your templates. And um, Laura has asked too, is it possible to share an export of the course or not? <laughs> Maybe people are really excited. And I myself said, I, I, wanna, I wanna take the course. Like not only am I excited by your teaching techniques, but you've gotten me excited about the content. Like I wanna enroll in this course. Hey, you know, nothing beats art history, right? I'm more <laughs> than, I am more than happy to share the template that um, we have made. Um, and I'm more than happy to, to port out some of my modules. Um, just know that we're on SAS and it's the original experience. So you're not, I don't think you're gonna be able to go backwards if you're on, if you're self-hosted, is anybody still self-hosted, do you know? I don't think that'll go backwards, but you could go forwards. So, so you could, if you're on SAS, um, you could definitely use our template and I'd be happy if you can, how best could we gather the, any emails where we might need that, we could send that out. So um, people can um, contact me and I will, Pass it along. Okay. Put my email in the chat. It's simple monica.hill at blackboard.com. So you can contact me and I will pass it along to Linda. And also you can <laughs> contact me too, just if you have any questions or you just want some help setting up something similar in your own class, I'm happy to help. Well, thank That's you. What you I do. <laughs> Yes, I know. I, mean, I was so excited. So, yeah, you can see in the chat, Linda, just a lot of general excitement. Um, oh, great. About the, about the course. That's so great. I was afraid it would be boring. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm, you know, I, I taught um, English and uh, literature, and I was just 
thinking about your discussion boards and it's like, wow, these are great techniques for me to use in my courses too. And I have my discussions about yes. what they're reading, like ways to get them to go a little bit. Bring closer. it back into the classroom, yeah. make it seamless. Yes. I'm like, oh, this is great. I can, I'm eager to you know, get another section so I can do this. <laughs> <It's exciting. laughs> Well, thank you, everybody. I, I'm feeling the love. My God, I'm seeing this. The I'm just now seeing the, um, the chat, and I was like so nervous when I started, but now I'm feeling the love. Thank you. This is fantastic. This is, you accomplished two things. You got us. Not only did you get us excited about the the teaching techniques and what you were modeling here, but you also have a whole lot of people who now want to go take this art history course. <laughs> take modern art history. Well, you know what? I do teach it online in the fall and the summer. So just go to Hudson Valley Community College and sign up for modern art history. Yes. We, could, we could use the enrollments. That's good everybody, right? Yes. <laughs> I thank you everyone for joining us today. The recordings will be available um, on the main page. And they'll be there until the end of November, so you can still get access um, to, to the recordings as well. Thank you all. Thank you so much.